for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. God put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Would you join me in prayer? Our gracious and glorious God, you are great. We do not have words to begin to acknowledge how good and awesome and praiseworthy you are. We're grateful for the gift of life, for the capacity to enjoy and drink in the beauty around us. And in the quiet of this hour, we are grateful for opportunities to let you know of our love, our gratitude, and our commitment to follow in the steps of our Lord and Savior. And so move freely among us, speak to us, each one of us, the words we need to hear. We offer ourselves, we offer this time to you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. <laughs> close to God, and we're to be close to God, we need to be honest with God. So we join together in our prayer of confession and once again receive his gracious and glorious forgiveness. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, 
the Prince of Peace, our hope and our salvation. With humble hearts, we admit that too often we fail to reflect your grace in our dealings with others. Too often we allow ourselves to flirt with the darkness, holding on to grudges, closing our hearts to people in need, dishonoring you with our words and actions. Forgive us and restore us through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. Grace, mercy, and peace are ours through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's true. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. God sent Christ to make peace between himself and us, and has given us the word to make peace between God In the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. Thank you, Julian. <clears throat> I was hoping that Julian would be able to be in the class at 9 o'clock. You're forgiven. I know that's a bit early and you drive here. But I wanted him to be there because I knew that part of Dr. Cortman's presentation was how being forgiving and gracious and generous actually yielded longevity in study after study. And for those who are new to the chapel, Julian, our strongest voice, is 99 years old. So I kind of like to hold you up as our poster child. <laughs> Don't use that word, child. Oh. <laughs> now, if I were you, I'd hang on to that as long as I could. <laughs> but um, when we come to our times of prayer, that's a good reminder to us. Julian is a good icon for us. When God is at the center of our lives, circumstances do not overwhelm. They may sadden, they may trigger fear. We may at times find ourselves pulled into a bit of anxiety. That certainly is what our generation is experiencing right now. But they do not undo us not so long as we keep our hand firmly in God's and know that we can trust. In that confidence, let's go to God in prayer, praying these are new requests for Justin, diagnosed with stage four cancer at 22 years old, and for Terry, a husband who's passed away. Let's pray. Almighty God, we confess that we are easily undone by life. We become frustrated, we become impatient, we focus on what is wrong instead of what is right. In the political turmoil and climate that is America these days, we allow ourselves to be sucked into rancor and into careless talk, and into complaining and worrying, as opposed to praying, 
asking you to intervene, asking you to humble us as individuals and as a nation and remind us who we are and whom we follow. Gracious Lord, we pray for this world. We pray for peace where there is no peace and where hope has all but disappeared. We pray for those who are grieving, for those who are wounded or impoverished and hungry or cold and afraid, for refugees, for so many who are struggling sacrificially to care for them and to find a way to peace. Lord, send more light and embolden your people, embolden your church around the globe that we will not fear, we will pray and work all the harder for peace, for wholeness, for reconciliation, for justice. Lord, lead the way, raise up peacemakers. We pray for our own nation, that your children would discipline themselves to look to you, to the scriptures, to other faithful generations, as we discern where to place a vote or who to support or how to respond to the latest scandal. Lord, we can so easily be blown away or imbalanced. Pull us back, strengthen us, ground us, Help us to keep our eyes focused on you and our minds and our intellect transformed by your word and your word and spirit alone. We pray for so many within our own congregation who are needy, who are hurting, who need your comfort. We continue to lift up Margot and Cal and Walt. We pray now for Justin. Oh, how tragic to hear of a young man with such cancer. If it is your will, heal him. Give him now and those who love him that peace that goes beyond understanding and give his medical team a brilliance beyond their natural abilities. We pray also for Terry and for so many who are grieving death. We pray, Lord, that the day would quickly come when weapons of war, when disease would be no more. We place our hope in you. We place our lives in your good hands and ask you to listen, to hear us as we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
let us show our adoration for God in a very practical and earthly way as we bring our tithes and offerings before him. before you, O Lord. We ask that you will receive them, use them, guide our use of them, in order that your kingdom may come more and more in this very troubled and needy world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our psalm of the morning is Psalm 54. And it is one of the songs, psalms that should be sung, and as it says here, they should be sung with stringed instruments. To the leader, 
with stringed instruments, a Moschiel of David when the Ziphites went and told Saul, David is hiding among us. Save me, O Lord, by your name, and vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For the insolent have risen against me, the ruthless seek my life, they do not set God before them. But surely God is my helper, the Lord is the upholder of my life. The Lord will repay my enemies for their evil. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For the Lord has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Deborah. Well, we've all been in situations where the needs were greater than our own <coughs> abilities to meet them. And whether or not we had had strong faith when the problems came knocking at our door, we find ourselves praying and asking God to intervene. Both David who's accredited with writing Psalm 54, and Jesus, whose words we're going to hear in a moment, had this in common. They both knew what it was to have an intimate, beloved friend stab them in the back and turn into an enemy. David in Psalm 54 shows one way of responding to such moments in time. But I'd like us to listen now to the gospel 
as from what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, we hear Jesus speaking with a very different take. Again, this is God's word. Matthew 4, picking it up at verse 43. Jesus said, speaking to a large crowd, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For think about it. He makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. God sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And you'll notice I included the phrase, the Greek word teleoi, because the word perfect in that language could just as easily and perhaps more appropriately be translated, be mature, complete your purpose, be that for which God created you, grow into it, grow up, just as your heavenly Father is ultimately mature. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Well, over the summer months, I'm getting lots of good grandchildren time. As some of you know, little Rudy was in worship with me at the start of last week. Today he's down in Chapel Kids. And when I'm with our little grandchildren, I do something I don't do no, I just, I don't do it if they're not with me. <laughs> I go to a place in town that is just about extinct. And I typically spend a lot of money and a lot of time because I go to a bookstore, a real honest, a good bookstore where they have paper things called books. <laughs> But because I've got Rudy, or one of the little ones with me, I don't go to the biography, the history, the theology. I make a B line right for the children's section, where all the real wisdom lies. <laughs> As I was looking not only at the words of Psalm 54, which on the face of it looks like a, forgive me, but a fairly innocuous psalm. I mean, it's short, it's to the point, there's nothing really shocking about it. But as I spent time putting it into context, reading the psalm that came before, the psalms that came after, getting into who are these Ziphites and why is he hiding, I found myself drawn to a book, a little adorable book that I had read years ago. It took me not too long to find it. It's still a bestseller. It's Judith Vorst, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. And it's follow-up, I'll Fix Anthony, Long Island translation. I'll Fix Anthony. Let me read you a bit of I'll Fix Anthony, because I hear, if you listen carefully, if you read between the lines of Psalm 54 and those imprecatory psalms, you hear a little bit of this five-year-old's thinking. Here's what she writes. My brother Anthony can read books now, but he won't read any books to me. He plays checkers with Bruce from his school, but when I went to play, he says, go away or I'll clobber you. I let him wear my Snoopy sweatshirt, but he never lets me borrow his sword. Mother says, deep down in his heart, Anthony loves me. Anthony says, deep down in his heart, he thinks I stink. 
Mother says deep, deep down in his heart where he doesn't even know it, Anthony loves me. Anthony says deep, deep down in his heart, he still thinks I stink. When I'm six, I'll fix Anthony. When I'm six, I'll float, but Anthony will sink to the bottom. I'll dive off the board, but Anthony will change his mind. I'll breathe in and out when I should, but Anthony will go glug, glug, glug. When I'm six, my teeth will fall out and I'll put them under the bed and the tooth fairy will come and take them away and leave dimes. Anthony's teeth won't fall out. He'll wiggle and wiggle them, but they won't fall out. I might sell one of my teeth, but then again, I might not. Anthony is chasing me out of the playroom. He says I stink. He says he's going to clobber me. I have to run now, but I won't have to run when I'm six. When I'm six, I'll fix Anthony. Da, 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 da. The voice of David, clobber my enemies, put an end to them. And lest we think it's only the saints of old or the five-year-olds among us, let me share with you. I go back to this every five years or so. One of Germany's great poets is Heinrich Hein, uh, back in the early 1800s. And in a book, in a memoir that sounds so beautiful, it's Gedanken und Einfallen, Deep Thoughts and Ideas, he writes this about himself. Mine is a most peaceable disposition. My wishes are a humble cottage with a thatched roof, but a good bed, good food, the freshest milk and butter, flowers before my window, and a few fine trees before my door. And if God wants to make my happiness complete, he will grant me the joy of seeing some six or seven of my enemies hanging from those trees. <laughs> Before death, I shall, moved in my heart, forgive them all the wrong they did me in their lifetime. One must, it is true, forgive one's enemies, but not before they have been hanged. <laughs> then comes Jesus. <laughs> and the question for this morning. And I've got to tell you, it's a question that I know is going to offend some. I'll own it up front. Let's talk. <laughs> the question for the day is, which side of the Sermon of the Mount are we living? You know, David was often described as a man after God's own heart. He loved the Lord. He was horrifically violent and sinful at moments in life, but he tried, he normally pulled himself back from the edge and God forgave and forgave and forgave. But the key to understanding what he wrote in Psalm 54 is actually right there in the beginning of the text, the title, which is original, I've mentioned this before as we go through the Psalms. When you see those italicized titles in your translations, in your Bibles, those are original. Those are a good two, 3,000 years old. And so as Julian pointed out, this was written to be played by music. I imagine some beautiful little lyre, little strums, a few chords. It'd be fun someday to try to reinvent them. And unlike many of them, it tells us why it was written. A mascal, that seems to be a musical category, a mascal of David, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, the first king of Israel, David is in hiding among us. Ooh. If we did not know that, we might think this was a sweet little psalm and move on. 
but it forces us to read between the lines and it forces us to underline and bold and put a few exclamation points over phrases like put an end to them. <laughs> I want the day to come when I can look down on my enemies. So let me remind you if you've already studied it, let me bring you up to speed. If not, who, pray tell, are these Ziphites and why is David hiding? Any of you who think the Bible is boring, oh my heavens, when you go home, open it up and open it up to 1 Samuel, start at 23. This is a rated R reading. David is in hiding. David, the little shepherd boy. We know little David. I mean, he's the guy we love. We have this halo around his head. We think of him as this sweet little shepherd singing to his sheep, anointed by the prophet of Israel to be the next king secretly. When Saul, a man who today absolutely would be diagnosed as bipolar, manic depressive, when Saul was in his down cycle, he would have this sweet, young face, David, come and play his songs for him. And it would soothe his spirit. Years passed, David gave him his daughter in marriage. Then comes the story of Goliath. And David, this sweet little David, goes out to the field. He kills the giant. And suddenly Israel is singing his praises. And here's the song. And here's the dance. It's recorded more than once in the scripture. Saul has killed his thousands. And David his tens of thousands. And man, that bipolar kicks in with a fury. At one point, sitting at the family meal, Saul actually picked up a spear and threw it at David. David goes into hiding, and years pass where Saul OCD obsessively pursues him with, how many is it? 3,000 soldiers? while David collects for himself what amounts to a little guerrilla band of 300. And they are in this cat and mouse chase through the deserts, living in caves, escaping just as Saul arrives for years. Oh my heaven, Saul was not gonna let go of this scratch match. David twice came upon Saul's camp while Saul was deep in sleep. Twice, he literally walked up beside him and took with him evidence that he was that close. But then in the morning, when the sun came up from a safe distance, would say, Saul, I could have killed you. I'm telling you, I am not your enemy. You are my king. I am loyal. And for a time, Saul would back down. So who was David hiding from? He was hiding from Saul. But who are these Ziphites? <laughs> they are the people of Ziph, <laughs> a wilderness desert people, and we don't know a whole lot more than that. Why would they turn them in? That, now that I have some speculations on. And it tells us something about human nature. Not only David, but it tells us something about you and me. Clearly, in this psalm and in others, David felt he was a victim. I am innocent. Why are they doing this to me? I don't deserve this. But let me read you one small part of what David and his men were doing as they were running through the wilderness. Don't have the actual text, it's in 1 Samuel 23. Oh, here it is. David crossed the border to escape Saul. I'm fast forwarding. He makes a pact with the Philistines, Israel's traditional enemy. And from there, they carried out raids on small villages, killing every man and woman 
so that it would not be reported back who they were or what they were doing. Why might the Ziphites have turned him in? Hmm. This is a man slaughtering villages of innocent civilians. And the reason I bring this up is not just to tarnish David's record. The Bible does know whitewash. It's there. That's where I get it. But to say there's a little bit of that, I'm a victim in all of us when hard times come. This sense that I did nothing to so-and-so. I don't know why she turned on me. When I think the wisdom of Scripture suggests when someone appears as an enemy, I mean, that's a hard word. That's a hard label. That's a hard title to place on someone. When someone appears as an enemy, perhaps it makes sense to stand back and say, have I somehow played into this? Is there perhaps, even if it's some small little piece, that I've done to keep the cycle going. Some little affront that I thought they didn't even notice. That perhaps a word of apology might crack through the cycle that's come from it. I'll just throw that out there. What I find noble and praiseworthy in Psalm 54 is David's reaction to being pursued by enemies and feeling that, yes, I could fight back, but I'm not going to fight back. He's my king. I owe him my allegiance. I love the fact that when he felt trapped, he knew there was one avenue of escape, and that was prayer. And not just prayer, but a prayer that was so grounded in trust that notice he quickly went from praying from God to help him, for God to vindicate him, to at the end saying, and Lord, with the free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I am already imaging. I am already seeing your hand delivering me. I am already granting you the power, granting you the trustworthiness. I am already beginning the praise. That is worth imitating. That is worth the price of the psalm in and of itself. When we are in a hard time, when we have been betrayed, and looking around this room, I can't imagine one of us have come to this point in life <laughs> without knowing what that feels like. When we have been betrayed, the only helpful first response <clears throat> is to find words and talk to God. And if words fail, to take the New Testament up on its promise that even our groans and our moans are translated for God. The God who loves us, who created us, who is ever so eager to help show us the way through. David so often failed, <laughs> so often failed to see that. This whole concept that, frankly, we in the church, we in the Christian world can take for granted, this whole concept of loving one's enemy, forgiving one's enemy, praying for those who persecute us, that, that had not yet been spoken. That had not yet been written. And so we can forgive David. Let me share you one of the more shocking I didn't want to have it in the bulletin for fear we'd have a youngster among us, but what, Psalm 137, listen to what he wrote there. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites. They were cousins of the Ziphites. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, you devastator. Blessed shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Blessed shall they be who take your little ones and dash their heads against a rock. Ah. 
He's forgiven. He's on the other side of the Sermon on the Mount. He's on the other side of the incarnation, the birth of Christ, the teachings of Jesus, the crucifixion, the resurrection that tell us God meant it when he said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Forgive, and it shall be forgiven you. And I know those words are so hard. Those words hurt when a wound is fresh. Those words might even sound outrageously naive in a world where Oh, my Lord, how do you even begin? You know, people drive a truck through a crowded procession where people intentionally blow up innocent men, women, and children. I mean, how do you even make sense of this? But what the evil one accomplishes in our day and age does not change the word of the Lord to those who follow Jesus. It doesn't matter how loud, how rancorous, how vulgar, how profane the political verbiage becomes. Those who follow Jesus have no choice but to struggle against the tide and refuse to give in to fear, which leads to anger, which leads to hate, which leads to suffering. Hard words. And frankly, if Jesus had only spoken those words and then gone about a normal long life, I might be tempted to take it with a grain of sand. You know, hey, you know, he's an optimist. He's thinking the best of people. He's unusual. But the fact that he not only taught them, but from the cross said, Father, forgive them, means that for me, speaking for me now very personally, for me to call him Lord, means I have no choice. Shame on me if I give in to hating or demonizing a politician or a stranger on the street. Shame on me if I allow fear to make me plaster an entire groups of people as evil. We've been taught a better way And we not only have been taught that and called to that, we have the promise of the Spirit of Christ, the living Holy Spirit, who says, I can make the impossible possible. I can take your crusty, kind of irritable, I'm going to get you before you get you, knee-jerk reaction. I can baptize that and teach you how to be a person of grace a person of forbearance, a person who values every single soul on earth as God values them. Easy? Oh, my heavens, no. (laughs) If it were easy, we wouldn't need the spirit. But is it God's will? Yes. And must we encourage one another in staying with it? Absolutely. We cannot do it alone. We need to spend time on our knees in prayer, especially for those who drive us crazy. We need to spend time in the scriptures reminding ourselves of God's grace. We need to spend time with other believers in Bible study, in prayers, in grief groups, in support groups, simply schmoozing on the beach or in the dining halls, calling each other in this dark time to be the light of the world we were created to be. We are the light of the world, and the darkness has never extinguished the light. So may it be. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, it is not easy to be light and to reflect the grace of our Lord and Savior in these times. But we know that it's never been more important. And so help us to live into our claim to be followers of Jesus. Give us what we need so that we can truly be words of sanity 
peacemaking, and grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Mm. Amen. appreciate some one-on-one -on -one prayer this morning please join members of our prayer team up here in the prayer corner but now let's prepare to go out into the world bold and unafraid knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are with us now and will remain always amen